So I, I'm going to have to start by apologizing that I don't speak Spanish, so I'm going to have to talk in English. And uh, I always say, that, yeah, I know I should. And, and uh, I always say, next time I'm going to talk in Spanish, but it tends to always be the next time, and I'm here apologizing again. So. So I'm going to talk about good practices for estimating accuracy and area of activity data. So activity data here meaning uh, land use change or land cover change data, right? And I'm using the word good practices because these are not the best practices, right? What is best will vary from case to case, from situation to situation, and with the objectives of the study, right? But the good practices, if you follow the good practices recommendations, you'll end up with unbiased estimators of accuracy and area. Right? And there is a document that is currently being, it will be published in a remote sensing environment relatively shortly that outlines all of these good practices in more detail than what I will talk about today. So I will refer you to this paper if you want more information. And I should also say that this is a Gofsi Gold effort. This is authored by a bunch of people within the Gofsi Gold group. And I'm not going to talk more about that. You can go on Google and search what Gofsi Gold is. But it includes uh, Steve Stamen, uh, from Sonny, you mentioned him. <coughs> Mike Waller for Canadian uh, Forest Service. Giles Food from England, Martin Harold, and Curtis Wood for Woodcock from uh, BU2. And I am being funded by Silva Carbon here. I should mention that too. So these are all capacity building efforts funded by Silva Carbon. And, uh, and the idea here is that we provide these recommendations, right? And you follow them. And if anybody has any problems with that, you can always point back to us and say that, well, we followed what these people said. And if you have a problem with that, then talk to these people. Don't blame us, right? That's one of the I ideas behind this document, right? to take some of that uh, responsibility away from you and put it on us instead, right? And we're basing all of this on relatively old material. This is nothing new. It's nothing, nothing that I've figured out myself. We are making use of Cochran's book from 1977, for example, and Card, Don Card from NASA Ames. He implemented these methods back in the early 80s, right? So this is nothing new, but we're trying to take this theory that is in this book, for example, and apply it to make it accessible and applicable to maps and error matrices. Right? You know, and why do we do that? Well, the reason why we want to use remote sensing in the first place is that it provides this wall-to-wall -wall coverage, right? We can't get that any other way. And that's the big advantage of using remote sensing. The problem is that the results of that will never be perfect. There will always be errors. Right? You can never make a perfect map. And if the map has errors, then the areas of the individual map categories will be biased because of classification errors. Right? So what we need to do is to implement an accuracy assessment to identify those errors and then adjust the map categories, the areas of the map categories for those classification errors. And also use that information to provide <coughs> a confidence interval around the areas of the individual map categories. And there are different ways of do th doing that. There are different estimators you can implement. And which estimators that is the best to use will vary from case to case, right? 
So before we start, before I start outlining some of these good practices, I think we should introduce some terminology here. So I said we have classification errors. We can always assume that we have errors. So we identify those errors in a map by an accuracy assessment. And the idea behind the assessment is that we treat the map as the population, and we draw a sample from that map. <coughs> And then we label, we provide a reference label for each unit in that sample. A reference label that hopefully corresponds to the true con conditions on the ground. And we call all the labeled sample units, we call it the reference classification. So that is not a map, it's like a bunch of points, right? A bunch of sample units. So then we have the map and we have the reference classification. So we can compare the map and the reference classification for each unit in the sample and construct an error matrix. Right. And I don't know if you can see that, it's down here at the bottom, but we have a simple error matrix here where we have the map represented by the rows and the reference data by the columns. Right. So in this case, we have, in class number one, we have 100 sample units. So 100 units of the total sample is in class number one. And out of those 100 units, 97 were correctly classified. Class one, in this case, we can say it's deforestation, right? And then we have errors of commission here. We have zero, point, zero and three errors of commission, right? So this is stuff that was classified as belonging to map class number one, but in reality, it's class two and three, which is forest and non-forest. Right. And then we have errors of omission. Three plus two errors of omission. So these are sample units that were, in the reference data, determined to belonging to class three and two, but in reality, or they were classified as belonging to, uh, oh, sorry, I'm mixing this up. They were classified as two and three, but in reality, they are class number one. These are areas of omissions. So in this case, if class number one is deforestation, it means that we omitted some deforestation, right? We classified it as something else, but in reality, it was actually deforestation. So as I said, we design an accuracy assessment and we implement that to find these errors. Right. And there are three components of the accuracy assessment. The first is a sampling design, which is the protocol for selecting the sample that we will interpret. Right. And the end result of this is that we have a sample of the map. So we have the map and then we have a bunch of points or polygons or blocks or whatever it is on the map, and that is our sample, right? The next step then is to interpret the reference label or provide a reference label for each unit in the sample here. And this is defined by the response design. So the protocol that leads to an agreement between the reference classification and the map is specified by the response design, right? And the output of this is an error matrix. So we have the reference label and we have the map label. By comparing them, we construct an error matrix. So once we have the error matrix, we analyze it. So the analysis refers to the measures of accuracy and area that we want to obtain and how to do that. How do we estimate the accuracy in the areas? And the output here is unbiased estimators of accuracy of area plus minus a confidence interval. So starting with the first component, sampling design. So I'm just gonna go through some of these recommendations and then provide an example from the literature of how this is being done. So first of all, if the reference classification already exists, 
in the form of a forced inventory, you won't have to do any of this, right? If you want to use your forced inventory as a source of reference data, then you don't need to de design a new sample, obviously, right? You can just skip this part. Right? But if that doesn't exist, or it exists but you don't want to use it for whatever reason, you're going to have to create your own reference classification, right? And we recommend to implement a probability sampling design that allows for design-based inference. Right? There are other verse, there are other ways of doing that. It's a model-based inference, for example. <clears throat> and that's for perfectly viable, too. The design-based inference framework is very well documented and it's fairly easy to understand and easy to implement it. And that's the reason why we're recommending it. <clears throat> and we do recommend a stratified random design. Again, it's very well documented, it's fairly easy to implement, and it satisfies both most of the accuracy assessment objectives. Right? And we also then recommend to stratify based on the classes of your map to reduce the uncertainty in the class-specific estimates. And we don't necessarily recommend a clustered sampling unless there is a good reason for doing so. Right? If you really, really need to cluster your sample, then you should do it. But if you don't have a strong reason to do so, I would not recommend a clustered sample. It tend to complicate the analysis. Right? And also, if resources are adequate, stratified by subregions, if there are different regions you're interested in, or if there are different regions that you know have a lot of errors, you can kind of stratify accordingly. Right? And we talked about this, or, or uh, Andy mentioned this in the beginning of this session, uh, when it comes to the sample size. So the size of the sample here must be large enough to yield sufficiently precise estimate, but it also should be small enough to be manageable, right? We can base the reference classification on 30,000 units, right? Which will give us very precise estimate, but it's not manageable. It will take too much manpower, right? So we can either settle for a number, we can kind of wing it and just say that we're going to do this many sample units. We do recommend a little bit more informed decision, a decision informed by the desired standard error of the accuracy or the area depending on the objective of the study. So once we have estimated the total sample size, we need to figure out how to allocate that to the different strata, which typically would be the different map classes. And we recommend something rather simple, 50 to 100 units in the change classes or the very small classes, and then kind of split the difference, or split the rest among the larger strata, depending on the size of them. And I'm gonna provide an example here uh, from, you know, my home area. So this is the city of Boston down here. So this is New England, the northeastern United States. New York City is down here. So this is a um, land use change study that we're currently doing in this area. And we're studying change from 1985 to 2012. And we're doing this in kind of a time series approach. So we're looking at each pixel in this study area, right? And we have extracted all the Landsat data that's ever been acquired for this area. So we fit like a time series model here to the observations. And when observations, when the actual Landsat observation starts deferring from the predicted model, we infer that a change has occurred. And then as soon as we have enough new observation after the change, we fit the new model. And then we use the coefficients here in the model to classify the land cover before and after the change. So what we get is like a continuous land cover classification here. This is kind of an attempt to provide 
IPCC tier three level activity data reporting. Right? And one of the objectives here is that if in case we have, let's say that this curve is if we reverse back to four, you know, this curve here will go down and we will classify it as forced again. Right? So we will have like a forest to forest change. So this allows us to separate between you know, temporary changes in land cover, such as forest to forest or managed forest, and permanent conversions of forest. So we do that from 85 to 2012, and we end up, we end up with these different classes here. So we have a set of permanent classes, so stuff that are not changing, and then we have a couple of change classes here. So we have three different forest conversion classes. Right? So forest conversion to commercial industrial areas, you know, high impervious surfaces, and then forest conversion to uh, residential areas, houses and so on and so forth. And then forest conversion to other land uses, you know, golf courses and whatnot. And then we have this class here, which is then manage forest, right? So we have forest that is being cut, but then reverts back to forest, right? So we separate the kind of manage forest from the conversion of forest, right? And then we have conversion to forest here. So we have six different change classes here. And if we look at the area proportions, we see that these are very small. Like a lot of them are less than 1% of the total map area. Right? So a stratified random sample design is obviously a very good choice here because it allows us with these classes of strata because then it allows us to sample these individual change classes. Right? If we do a simple random or a simple systematic sample, we would never be able to sample these adequately unless we have a very, very large sample rate. So we estimate the total sample size using an equation from Cochrane's book, and it's simply a function of the area proportions, the mapped area proportions of these different classes, the kind of stratum variance, and then like a desired standard error of the change area. So we have to focus on one of these change classes. So if we're looking at the forest to low impervious or forest to residential is what it is in reality, it's about 0.5 or 0.53 percent of the map. So we can say that our desired confidence interval of this area would be plus minus 0.5 percent. So that would be you know, 0.5 divided by 2 divided by 100 would be the standard error that goes in here. Right? And if we do that, we get a sample size of about 1,400. The next step then is to allocate these 1,400 units to the different strata. Right? And if we follow those guidelines that I outlined before, follow these good practice recommendations, we put at least 50 units in these very small classes, right? And then we kind of split the difference among the stable classes here. So we put 50 in each of these, and then what is left of these 1,400, we split into the stable classes here, depending on the size of the strata. Right? And what we end up is a sample that looks like this. So this would be the outcome of our sampling design. A stratified random sample, you can see are big chunks of intact forest here that are less sampled than some of the other areas here, for example. So the next step here now would be to, using some form of reference data, look at what is the actual land use label or land use change label for each one of these units. Right? So this is what our map tells us. So we now have an answer for each of these units according to the map. 
The next step would be to find an answer according to the reference data. So we need to provide a reference label for each of these, right? And the response is signed, 10 minutes? No. So that leads into response design. And the recommendations here is that the reference data that we're using to provide these reference labels <coughs> should be of higher quality than the data used for creating the map. Or if using the same type of data, the process of creating the reference classification has to be more accurate than the process of creating the map. And we also recommend to implement protocols for accounting for the uncertainty in the labeling of these units. Right? For example, we recommend using three interpreters to break ties, for example. And then preferably have each interpreter specify like a level of certainty in the label. Right? So are the interpreters very certain that this is you know, conversion of force to low density residential, for example? Right? Or are they not so uncertain? So somehow record the level of confidence here. And if we do that, we end up with an error matrix. So I just have a few slides. If we go back to this example from New England, I said we make use of a time series model. So we're making use of all the observations ever acquired for one single pixel. Right? So if we're going to create a reference classification, we have to make sure that the process of creating that reference classification has to be more accurate than that, than the mapping effort, right? And we decided that a manual interpretation of each of these units using the same time series is a more accurate process than automatically classifying it, right? So we have this tool here. And we're looking at each of these units, and we can plot the time series for each year back to 1982, right? So we can move the slide here and plot the actual Landsat observations acquired for this pixel here. And we plot one year on top of the other year, right? And I haven't, I don't know how well you can see that. But if you continue to just slide the scales, you look at one year after the other, eventually you'll see that something happens. Right? And you also display the images, you will be able to make that call, right? You know, when did it happen and what happened here? Right? So we argue that this process is more accurate in providing a label of what happened in this pixel compared to that automated classification approach I just showed. Right? So we do that for each of these units in this, for each of the 1400 units in the sample, and we then have a reference label and a map label. And we compare them and we get an error matrix. Right? And the analysis this is the last, the final step of the accuracy assessment where we estimate the accuracy in area based on the error matrix, based on the information in the error matrix. Right? And the recommendation for the analysis is to use estimators of accuracy in area that are unbiased. And there are a lot of different estimators that one could implement. Right? We recommend that if you have a simple, random, or systematic, or stratified random sample with categorical, or categorical response variable, meaning that you have like discrete data, forest, water, you know, forest loss, forest conversion to this, that, and the other, and a map, very well-defined map categories, we recommend the use of stratified estimation. Right? If you have a continuous variable, like if you have a degradation map where each pixel has like a value of degradation from 0 to 100%, then there are other estimators that might be more, um, might pro provide a better answer on the, five minutes. Other estimators that might be 
uh, better, such as a model assisted regression estimator, for example. Right? But if this is the case, we recommend a stratified estimation approach. We recommend reporting users accuracy, producers accuracy, overall accuracy, and very important, to quantify the uncertainty in the area and the accuracy estimates, right? So providing a confidence interval around the area estimates, right? And we also don't recommend the use of the kappa coefficients, for example. You know, stick to, we recommend the use of these accuracy measures, area, and confidence intervals around accuracy and area. Right? So let's see if I can do this in, in four minutes, right? An example here, we now have an error matrix that is much more simple than, um, than what we'll get out of the New England exercise, right? So we only have, again, three classes here. Class one is deforestation, class two is stable, non stable forest, class three is stable non-forest, right? So two stable classes, one change class. And we have a total sample of 500 units. And it's a stratified sample here. So we have 100 units in the deforestation class, although it's only 1.3% of the map. Right? And then we have 300 units in the stable forest, uh, another 100 in the stable non-forest stratum. Right? So since this is a stratified sample, we have like an unproportional number of units in the different stratum according to the area. Right? So we put 100 units in 1.3% of the map, and we put another 100 units in 35% of the map. So we can't really use the sample counts in the error matrix to express accuracy in area. We, the first thing we need to do is to convert the error matrix to estimate the area proportions. Right? And that is fairly easy to do. We just take the mapped area proportion and then the kind of entries in the, in the error matrix in terms of sample count, and we divide, them, divide that number by the total number of units in that stratum. Right? So we do that for each entry, for each of the nine entries in the error matrix, and we get an error matrix expressed in terms of area proportions. Right? So now we express the commission and omission errors as area proportions. Right? So instead of saying that we have 3 plus 2 errors of omission, we say that 0.6% of the map was classified as stable forest, but in reality it was deforestation. 1.2% right? of the map was correctly classified deforestation. Right? So we express the error matrix in area proportion. And all we need to, all the information needed to estimate accuracy area and the confidence interval of accuracy in area is in this error matrix. Right? The estimated area proportions and the mapped areas here. Well, we don't even need this here. Right? Everything is in here. So as I said, the map is represented by the rows, and the reference data is represented by the columns, right? Which means that the area proportion of class number one, according to the map, is given by this plus this plus this, which is 1.3%, right? We knew that from before. On the other hand, the area of class number one, according to the reference data, which is supposed to be more correct, is given by the column total, right? 2.6%. And this is what Cochrane refers to as a stratified estimator, right? So these column totals here would be the area, the stratified area estimates of these three different classes, right? And we can take the estimated area proportion and we just multiply it by the total map area and we now have an area estimate 
of deforestation, for example, ex expressed in hectares, right? So what we do when we look at the column totals here, what the stratified estimator do, what the stratified estimator does is that it excludes the error of commission, but includes the error of omission. Right? So it excludes the stuff that was overestimated, but includes the stuff that we missed out on. And then we provide a confidence interval around the different area, the, around the estimated areas. And again, we have, it's a rather simple equation given by Cochrane. All the information is in the estimated area proportion matrix. Right? We do that, we get a standard error of the column total. We multiply that with the total map area, we get a standard error in terms of hectares of deforestation, for example. And we multiply that by 1.96, we get a 95% confidence interval of the area of deforestation. And then finally, we want to express the user, producer, and overall accuracy. And again, we can't do that just using the sample counts, because it's a stratified sample, so the number of units per stratum is unproportional to the area. Right. So we need to calculate the accuracy measures using the area proportions. Right. So if we're looking again at the deforestation class, we have overall accuracy, which is not class specific. That's the overall accuracy for the whole map. It's the kind of diagonal total here. Right. And then we have user's accuracy of the deforestation class, 1.2% right? divided by 1.3%. And then finally, we have producer's accuracy, which is very low in this case, 48%. It's low because we have a lot of omission errors, right? We have 0.6 plus 0.7% omission errors, right? which is almost, which is the same amount as the amount of correct correctly classified deforestation, which is why we get a very low producer's accuracy. If we were to calculate producer's accuracy based on the sample counts, for example, and not the area proportion, the producer's accuracy would be 97 divided by 102, which is like 95%. Right? But that's a biased estimate of the producer's accuracy. We need to take the areas into account when we do that. So I know I'm, I'm overdue here. <laughs> we don't have to eat lunch. Okay. <laughs> no, we have, we have one more. All right, so that was it. Secretaría de Medio Ambiente y Recursos Naturales.